right, so here we go, looking at the second half of how to reach Joe's witnesses. Again, the witnessing part. Uh, one thing that uh, one slide I accidentally skipped uh, in the first part and everything, uh, it was brought to You might want to kind of go over that just a tad because, you know, it feels like it's an important question. So it states that if the Watchtower Society really is God's spokesperson, which is the greatest of all gifts to mankind, Jesus or the Watchtower Society? Well, so really, what is that greatest gift? Is it Jesus or the Watchtower Society? Again, you got to get them to think of this, okay? you got to get them to think of that. And ask them why. And they, So again, we need to make sure that uh, we get them to think about things. And again, separate the Bible and Jesus from the Watchtower Society of itself. That is the key. So again, now looking into uh, the second part of this. So we ended up the first half looking at how to kind of get around their defenses and kind of start tearing down that wall a little bit to where we can get them to think independently. But when we witness to a Jehovah's Witness or anybody from a cult or a false religion, we have to make sure that we are prepared to disciple people. It's not just you're going to go in there like a whirlwind, give them all this stuff, and then just leave them high and dry. You can't do it. You definitely cannot do it. Again, this is no ordinary conversion experience when you're dealing with people like this. It's not like you're going up against to somebody who just doesn't go to church and might have a slight belief in God or whatnot. This is not an ordinary conversion experience. Once the reality that the Watchtower Society is not to be trusted, the Jehovah's Witness is going to start spiraling. The witness will start spiraling a little bit. And if you're not there to provide a safety net for them, it could be disastrous. So again, once they realize they can't trust the organization the way they thought they could, it's going to have a lot of major impacts on them. They're going to go through a lot of different things all at once. They're going to feel a lot of emotions all at one time, and it's going to go from one to another to another to another. They're going to feel a loss of identity. Why? Because their whole being is in the organization. A loss of trust. Oh, I trusted them, but now they're, but they're untrustworthy. It's going to take a while to build trust again for them to actually trust somebody or something again. A loss of faith. Because their faith is shattered. Anger. Of being duped. Guilt. Allow themselves to be duped. Fear. I'm about to lose everything that I've ever had. Depression, disappointment, frustration, anxiety, failure, defeat, and many more things. They're going to be feeling all these things. They're going to be thinking all these things and stuff. We can't leave them high and dry. We can't leave them by themselves. You have to be willing to disciple after you, when you start this process. And if you're not willing to invest the time... It's almost not wor worth the time to begin. That's something they need to remember. They're going to have to make a hard choice. Once they're confronted with the truth that the Watchtower Society is not God's organization and they do not have the truth, they're going to have to make a choice if they're going to leave the Watchtower Society or not. And do note, if they do leave the Watchtower Society, they will be disfellowshipped. Which basically means excommunicated, which that means you're being kicked out. And all the members will have absolutely nothing to do with you. That's another sign of a cult. Because if you get out of it, then they're told to have zero contact with people who get out of any cult. So they're going to lose their friends, they're going to lose family members, they may lose their parents. They may lose their children. They may lose their co-workers as well. They're going to have a lot of loss in their life, guys, if they choose to leave this organization. It's a big decision that they have to make. And we need to make sure we understand that. And they will literally be all alone. It will be a very traumatic experience and they're going to be all alone. It is important for you to gain their trust and friendship through this procedure and through this. 
We need to make sure that you're gaining their trust and their friendship. Well, how do you do that? Spend time with them. Spend time with them reading the Bible, asking them questions. Let the Bible speak for itself at first. Again, don't try to sit there and explain Scripture. Let the Bible speak for itself. God's Word has the ability to speak for itself, especially to a heart that's truly searching. So again, they're going to have trust issues with anything you say. Again, they're also going to have some of those Jehovah's Witness doctrines still floating through their head. So you're going to let the Bible speak for themselves. Start introducing them to new people who can give them, who can help them grow as well. Because why? They're going to need a support system. They're going to need some people to help them out. And also, if you, know, if you start seeing signs of depression, introduce some new hobbies, activities, and stuff that you can do. And also, again, friends that do those things as well so they have somewhere to go and, hope, and help them through the process. Well, I didn't sign up to be a counselor or a therapist. Yeah, you did. <laughs> as soon as you started in on that journey of witnessing to that person, you did. And so it is your obligation to see them through it. Very important, keep your promises. Keep your promises with them. Why? Because they have trust issues now. And they're going, they want to know that they can trust you. And so if you say something, you better do it. So again, that's how you end up, get, again, getting the trust. Also note that after this, after you witness to them and you go through what we talked about the first session, things might not go the way you want them to go. Things might not turn out exactly the way you want to turn out. Be prepared for that. They may lose faith completely in religion. They may end up turning to be an atheist. Well, then what's the point? They're, well, they're still going to hell. But at least you had a shot at getting them to the truth. It's better to try to get them to the truth and then not try at all. Right? Better to try. Again, the watchtower lied to them so religion cannot be trusted. So again, they may end up you know, losing faith completely for a long time. That's where you, you can kind of keep, you know, seeing them a little bit. And you don't be a nuisance about it either, especially if they're, you know, going in those directions. But, you know, every so often check in on them and see what you can do to help them out. And also they may dig in their heels and refuse to believe the truth about the watchtower. Be prepared for that as well. Sometimes they're confronted with that truth, but they don't want it to, to see it and some people who don't want to see the truth they you know just dig in and just know that can't be so and just dig in with it and this happens often as anger and defensiveness sets in as you're talking about stuff again that's why you need to be kind and compassionate and considerate about things as you're talking to them don't take any of these things personally <laughs> Okay, don't take any of these things as a personal slight. Okay, it's not you, it's them and the organization. If your whole world, because let's face it, if your whole world was just exposed as false, including your faith, you would end up in this spiral as well. If your whole worldview, the way you looked at everything, was all of a sudden broken and everything came crashing down, you'd end up in the same predicament emotionally and psychologically, spiritually. So, understand that. Also, even after years of leaving the watchtower, they may still hold on to some of those teachings. Even if they do leave the watchtower, they do truly get saved, and they do start coming to your church or another Bible-believing church. No, nope, it's going to take some time to get rid of some of those teachings. Take time with them, read, study with them, answer questions. If you don't know, tell them you'll find out what the, question, what the answer is. But find out. <laughs> don't just leave them hanging, find out. Again, trust, right? We also need to make sure we allow the Holy Spirit to do His job. Right? Allow the Holy Spirit to work. The Holy Spirit will guide them as they are ready to hear truths. And they'll be open up to them. God always prepares the way. And gives you no more you can handle at any time, right? So that is what he's going to do. Allow the Holy Spirit to do his job. 
Also, pray for understanding for yourself and the Jehovah's Witness convert. Pray for understanding and wisdom for both of you, because you're going to need it. <laughs> and how to deal with this. And like I said, it will take time, but most of these false teachings will end up going away eventually. However, don't expect them to automatically start celebrating birthdays or holidays or stuff like that. Or going out to give blood. or I mean, don't expect them to just drop a lot of those things. If it comes up for their birthday, don't make a big fuss about it unless they, you know, bring it up or whatever. Again, holiday season, don't expect them to be, you know, participating and being all festive all of a sudden. It takes time. Allow them to adjust on their own time. That is going to be a good key there. So real quick, let's look at some extra pointers for witnessing and discipling. So we have a few extra pointers. Now I do recommend, again, when you're witnessing to them, to session one today first and everything. Build that rapport and have them think about those questions and stuff that we went through. Because again, that goes around a lot of stuff. But this section here is some extra stuff that can be added on if you've pretty much done everything through that and either they're still not convinced or maybe they are convinced and they got saved but they're still having trouble with some of these concepts here's some scriptures and stuff some things that can help to reconcile some of those doctrines and get them out of those ways of thinking okay that's why i say these are extra pointers all right for both of them so they can be used either or for either witnessing or discipleship all right so the first thing is to focus on the deity of christ Focus on the deity of Christ, that what, Jesus is Jehovah, right? Um, so a few things that we can end up looking at, the fact that Jesus is the first and the last. Because uh, Jehovah's Witnesses love talking about Jehovah being the first and the last. So we can use this to our advantage. All right. So take them through several scriptures. Isaiah 41.4. Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first, and with the last, I am he. So who is the first and the last? They'll say Jehovah. Right? Jehovah is the first and the last. All right. Then Isaiah 44, 6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Who's the first and the last? Jehovah. Jehovah's the first and the last. All right. Now, some people don't include these two references in Isaiah. I do because it shows a cohesiveness with the Old Testament and the New Testament. But Jehovah's Witnesses really like Revelation. I mean, Revelation's like by far their favorite book. Why? Because they like trying to predict things. So they really like the book of Revelation. So, again, use that to your advantage when dealing with uh, again, witnessing or discipling if you need to. Revelation 1 8. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning of the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. All right, so who's the first and the last? Jehovah. Jehovah is the first and the last. That's what their answer will be. Jehovah is the first and the last. Then take them to the back of the book. Revelation 21 5 through 7. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Who is the first and the last? Jehovah. Jehovah is the first and the last. That's what they will say. And you go, so Job was the first and the last here? Yes, Job was the first and the last. Okay, Job was the first and the last. All right, good. How about Revelation twenty two thirteen? I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. That's Jehovah, right? Yeah, it's Jehovah. Yep, that's Jehovah too. Then here comes the gut punch, so to speak. Here comes the twist. Revelation 1, 17 and 18. 
So we're going to split it up, though. Revelation 1, 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Stop. After 17. Ask him, who's the first and the last again? Jehovah. Jehovah's the first and the last. You can clarify that with the person you're dealing with. All right, read verse 18 now. Read verse 18. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Huh. So here's a question for them. When did Jehovah die? When did Jehovah die? Remember, they believe that Jesus is not God. Well, they believe he is a God. We'll get to that in a moment. But they do not believe that the Father and Son are the same. So again, when did Jehovah die? Now, they may try to tell you, because they are actually taught this in their doctrines, some, that this title of first and last is simply a title that Jehovah gave to Jesus after the resurrection and does not show his spirituality or his equality to God. So this is not showing equality. This is just a title Jehovah ended up giving Jesus. Okay. Chapter and verse. Where and when was this done? Because they really won't be able to tell you. I said resurrection, but I was thinking of something else. But they really won't be able to tell you when or where. So when and where was this done? And where in Scripture does it say so? Where in the Bible does it say that God gave this title to Jesus? I'll give you a spoiler alert. It don't. <laughs> it does not say anything about that. Because what, Jesus just ends up saying what? I am the Alpha and Omega. I am the first and the last. And again, I, I was dead, but now I'm alive. So again, that right there get them to think a little bit. Again, about, you know, the deity of Christ, the first and the last. But also you can use his acts of creation. Why? Because Jehovah's Witness believes that God or Jehovah used Jesus to create everything, right? That Jehovah created Jesus and then Jesus made everything else through Jehovah. That's what, they, that's what we saw they believed last night. All right, so let's attack that little idea. Isaiah 45, verses 11 through 12, and then we're going to jump to verse 18. Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and His Maker, ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands. Command ye me, I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens, and all their host have I commanded. Verse 18, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He, he created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. According to this, who made everything? Jehovah. right? God, Jehovah God made everything. Doesn't say Jesus made everything or Michael the archangel before he, you know, he was Jesus. It doesn't say that. It says that Jehovah made everything. Let's go to John, so John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 and 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And make sure you use the King James on this one, by the way. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things are made by Him, or that Him was not anything made that was made. And then verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as, the only, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So here we see that the Word made everything. The Word became flesh. The Word was Jesus, right? And again, the word was God. But again, the New World Translation says the world was, or so the word was a God. So again, make sure that by this point you're using, you know, the correct scripture. Don't use their scripture anymore by this point. 
So we can also use Colossians 1, 15 through 16. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Again, this is talking about the Lord Jesus. You can even go up a few verses where it actually begins to get context that it's talking about the Son of God, that it's talking about Jesus. I always refer, I always want context in everything you do with Scripture. Do not just, you know, pull one verse out and just say, oh, that's what it means. Context is key. And sometimes that means you have to read like three or four chapters to get the whole context of everything. But hey, if you want to be right, you got to make sure that you follow what the Bible actually says. So, now, again, according to this right here in Colossians, Jesus created everything. Now, again, many of them will try to say that, again, that Jehovah used Jesus to do it, right? So, technically, Jehovah still did it. Well, that's not, if that's the case, if Jehovah used Jesus to make everything, then Isaiah is wrong. Why? Because God said that I alone made everything. Jehovah said that I alone made everything. That was what we looked at a while ago in Isaiah. Mm -hmm. So again, that was back, again, we looked at Isaiah 45, verses 11 and 12 and verse 18. Because there he's talking about that Jehovah is the one by himself that made all. So if God, so if Jehovah used Jesus to create everything, then Isaiah is wrong. It's a contradiction. But if Jesus is Jehovah, then it's right. Well, what about the great I am? God's name of timelessness. That's, that's what I am that I am. Why? Because it's always in the presence. It's ti or present. It's timeless. God is timeless. He lives outside of time. So I am. We can use that as well. Exodus chapter 3, verse 6, and then verse 14. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say to the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am, oh, I guess I wrote that twice. <laughs> I, that must have copied out twice whenever I did that. All right, so again, what? Jehovah is the great I am, right? Jehovah is I am. Then you look at John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verses 57 through 59. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Yeah, he did. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Then, then the last verse is very important. Then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Jesus proclaimed to be I am. They might go, well, he's not proclaiming to be Jehovah. There's no proof of that. Oh, the Jews knew that. The Jews tried to kill him. Why did they try to kill him? Because he told them that he was God. By saying that I, by saying before Abraham was, I am, that was a name that they only used for God. God. So by him saying that, they knew exactly what he was meaning. That he was claiming to be God on the earth. But not only claiming, he actually is God. So again, Jesus is Jehovah. Again, focusing on the fact that Jesus is Jehovah. Colossians 2.9 Colossians 2, 9. 
For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So again, in Jesus Christ is the fullness of the Godhead in human flesh. Colossians 1.15 Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. It's how we see the Lord Jesus. Uh, we ain't got time for that. I'll, I'll pose this question to your pre preacher a little later, and he might share it with you. So, yeah. So, now the Jehovah's Witness may try to state that this shows that Jesus was created. That he is the firstborn of every creature. But remind them that they cannot trust the Watchtower Society's publications. you got to remind them that you can't trust the Watchtower. It's not inspired. It's not authoritative. And you cannot trust its interpretation. That's what they say. That's what the Watchtower Society says. Again, have them think about this verse in the context of what is being said. And, of course, the firstborn of every creature is actually referring to his resurrection. Because Jesus was the first person to ever come back to life on his own accord that's why he has that there firstborn of every creature again that's referring to his resurrection and there are other verses that kind of tie in with that as well that you could go to so you have john chapter 1 verse 1 and verse 14 we looked at that a while ago in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god the word was god and what the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That right there again, can sh again showing that Jesus is God, that Jesus is Jehovah. Another good one, John 10, verses 30 through 33. I and my Father are one. Doesn't get much plainer than that. Jesus told him, I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my father. For which of those works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because that, that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Again, it's important to follow up with those, with those statements that the Jews are making in their actions. Why? Because a lot of people will say, Jesus never claimed to be God. Yeah, he did. Well, that's not what he meant. Yes, it was. How do we know? Look at their reaction. They knew what he meant. They say, you're, you're a man and you're sitting there trying to be God. That's what they're accusing him of. They're accusing him of blasphemy. That's what the religious leaders actually found Jesus guilty of was blasphemy, even though he was not being blasphemous. He was telling them the truth. They just didn't want to hear it. So again, Jesus and the Father are one. He is Jehovah. Micah 5.2 is a good one. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Who's the only one that's everlasting? Jehovah God. You know, let's talk about Jesus and everything. So that could actually still refer to Jesus and creating. But Jesus is, if Jesus was created, he's not from everlasting. And everybody knows that this is a prophecy of Jesus' birth. And the fact that he's going to be the king of Israel during the millennial reign, he's going to rule over everything. But what, his ways are of old, and he, or has been from old, he's from everlasting. Matthew 1, 23. Matthew 1, 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. How could he have the name God with us if he's not God? Jesus was God. Philippians 2 6, another good one. Again, you can you know get context out of this as well. I just put the verse for time's sake, but 
Context could also work out here. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Jesus was in the form of God, and he considered himself equal to God and and thought that it was not a problem whatsoever because he was God and is God. Now, again, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they claim that Jesus is actually a lesser God. Remember what we told you about last night, right? They claim Jesus, after his resurrection, that he got, that Jehovah brought him up to the status of a lesser God. But Jesus cannot be a lesser God. He cannot be a lesser God. Why? Because the Bible says so. Isaiah 43, 10 through 11. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. There was no God before Jehovah God. Guess what? There's no God after him. Jesus could not be given a status of God by Jehovah and this statement be true. Jesus is Jehovah. Jesus is Jehovah God. Again, there's only one God, Jehovah, none else. Like I said, if Jesus, again, there would be another God with Jehovah, again, this statement would be false. So... We go through all that with Jesus a little bit, but another key thing is to go through the plan of salvation with them. Make sure you go through the plan of salvation with them, that they understand it. You can use many different tools for this. Uh, There's many scriptures you can go through for it. It, I'm not going to sit there. Again, Romans Road, everybody knows Romans Road a little bit. Pardon me. And so there's a lot of different ways to do that, but present them the gospel. Show them how to be saved. Make sure that the witness understands their need for God's grace. That is going to be a very big one. Make sure they understand the need for God's grace. Because guess what? We all need it. And God's grace is the key for everything. God's grace is a foreign concept to the Jehovah's Witnesses. They do not have it. Why? Because their road to salvation is works. They have to earn it. They do not understand anything about God's grace. So that needs to be a key focus. Now, if they are insistent, if they are insistent on works, then there's some verses that you can show them, and there are many more than what I have here. Again, I tried to limit some of the verses and stuff for time's sake because, I, again, it could get very you know, lengthy. But, again, there's many, many verses that, you know, in the Bible that says it's not of works. All right? There's just a few of them. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. I always like to tell people, you know, if you could earn your way to heaven, if you could actually, you know, earn salvation by doing a lot of good and stuff, you know what heaven would be like? A bunch of people trying to one-up each other of how they got there. Well, this is what I did to get, oh, well, I did way better than you. I did this over here. No, I, I get tired of listening to all that crap here on the earth. I don't want to do that for eternity. What? Nobody's going to be able to brag about anything that they've done in heaven. The only thing you're going to be able to brag about is the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for you. And so it is by grace you are saved through faith. And that faith is not even your faith. Again, punctuation is important. So, And that now of yourselves is the faith of Christ that keeps you. Jesus Christ had to have faith that his sacrifice would pay that price for your sins. That God the Father would accept it as the payment. And so he put faith in making a cure. And he's telling us, I have this cure. Here it is. We got to exercise faith in taking the cure. Our faith is like a roller coaster. It goes up and down. 
Jesus' faith is always there and always secure. That's why you can't lose it. Why? Because his faith is always secure in the cure. You think of it, somebody who made can- or found a cure for cancer. Did all the work out there and they got the cure for cancer. But they're going to give it free to everybody. You have to trust the person who made that cure that they're telling you the truth. And then what do you have to do? Take the cure. Same thing with salvation. You got to trust the man, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Lord and Savior, that he is telling you the truth. And then what? You got to accept the gift that he has given you. That is the way that you get saved. And then once you're cured, you're cured. Does it mean you're going to not mess up anymore? Oh, no. That's relationship fellowship, and we ain't got time for all that. But that uh, salvation booklet that I have out there for everybody, again, the Bible Believer's Guide to Understanding Salvation, all that's in there. Uh, a lot of different deep uh, stuff about salvation. And hopefully everybody gains a deeper understanding through that. Again, they're free. If you want, take as many copies as you want, hand them out for free. It doesn't matter. But again, um, I, do re- I do please ask if nobody try to sell it for whatever Reason why is because Jesus already paid the price for salvation, so we should not put a price tag on it. It should be free for all. So, continuing on, Romans chapter 3, verses 19 through 20. Then we're going to jump down to verses 27 to 28. For we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that man's ju- man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. The law is only there to show us how much we messed up. The law cannot save you. The only way the law can save you is if you keep it 100% perfect. If you don't break anything in the law. And nobody can do that. There was only one. And that was Jesus. That's why he was able to be the sacrifice for our sins. But so what? We are justified through faith. Romans chapter 10 verses 2 through 3. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And if you go to verse 1 there, it's talking about Israel. But I always say you can always kind of take Israel out of there. You can put whoever you want there. A Jehovah's Witness, a Muslim, yourself or somebody else, a person's name, a belief system, whatever. But until you submit to God, that's exactly what you're doing. You're trying to establish your own righteousness. You might have a zeal for God. You might love God, but you're not, you have no true knowledge of God. Why? Because you're trying to show God that you're worthy when you're not. You're trying to establish your own righteousness instead of submitting to the righteousness of God. So, again, it can't be, you can't earn it because, again, you have to submit to God's righteousness. You're not going to sit there and build yourself up to it. Romans eleven six. And if by grace, then is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more of no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. You gotta love Paul. He's tongue twister. So what, is it, so what Romans eleven six saying? So you can't have it two ways. You cannot have works and grace. It has to be one or the other. You either receive God's grace. Grace is receiving something you don't deserve. That's what grace is. You receive something you don't deserve. So works, you're earning what you do deserve. Those two don't go together. So if it's by grace, then it can't be of works. But if it's of works, it can't be by grace. So which one is it? The Bible says it's by grace and by faith. Not by the deeds of the law, not by the works of the flesh. And again, there are several other verses that can be utilized to help show that to the Jehovah's Witness. To help them understand that it is not a works salvation. Again, help them to understand God's grace. Because again, God's grace is a brand new concept to them. That they will not understand at first. 
So you have to walk them through there and handle them with kid gloves. Again, be kind, compassionate, and be patient. Patience is going to be key. But be insistent at the front as well because I have them answer the questions. You know, demand in a nice way an answer. Get them to think. Thinking is important for them. They have to start to think. And once they start thinking, again, like I said before, those walls and all that are going to start coming down. But then once they start realize, once they reject the wash tire society and realize that they've been uh, bamboozled, then you can start bringing in the true Jesus and true salvation and guiding them in the right way. So thank you all for uh, coming out for this series on how to witness Jehovah's Witnesses. I know it's been a crazy ride the past few days. But now we're going to get ready to do uh, the question and answer session. So let's go ahead and start that just a little tad early. Uh, do you want this part recorded or no? It don't matter to me. We can't. just need somebody to go fetch me in my box, please. And, and then we'll just randomly pull out questions, I, and we'll just see what we can do from there. Do what? Oh. Yeah, so here's the bibliographies again of some of the stuff of where all this information came from, unless it was cited, of course, on the slides themselves. So again, there's the first slide, and then the second slide. Again, a lot of books were read, a lot of websites were looked at, a lot of information was gathered to put this together. There is a lot of information out there that deals with some stuff some more. So again, uh, so just again, just so y'all know that you know I didn't just make all this stuff up. <laughs> all right, so let's see here. There are quite a few questions in here. All right, Lord, help me out. I'm put myself up on this thing. So let's see. Blank. No question. All right. That that's easy. I right hear it. All right, here's one. You mentioned the King James Version and the New World Translation as corrupt. So which translation is the best used? I did not mention the King James Version was corrupt. I stated that the New World Translation was corrupt. Um, the King James Version is the best one to use. It is based off of the Texas Receptus, which is about, uh, like I said last night, uh, about 95 to 97% of all the manuscripts, and they all agree together. We have literally more manuscripts for the Bible than any other ancient book out there. And 97, let's just say 97% of them all agree. And all that is, and the King James is based off of that Greek text. The New World Translation, a lot of the uh, modern translations, they're all actually based off the same which is Westcott and Hort's Greek text. So a lot of the newer versions of the Bi or translations of the Bible and stuff, they're actually based on the same thing that the New World Translation is. And some of those even have some of the same readings as the New World Translation, if you compare them out a little bit. So, again, King James Bible 1611, authorized version. And it became the authorized version because of the use by the Christians. It was not because King James commissioned it. It did not gain that title of authorized version until the mid to late 1700s, early 1800s. In fact, it wasn't even widely used by a lot of people right out the gate either. The pilgrims, when they came over, they brought over the Geneva Bible. And there were, so there are other you know, translations that were used. It took a while for Christianity to start using the King James. But, it, but once people started using it and seeing it and you know, feeling God's impact, and understanding, the, again, uh, how much better quality it is of a translation. That's why people started using it. That's why it became an authorized version. So I, I say that because a lot of people have a misnomer uh, about the author why it's called the authorized version. Well, King James, no, no, that's not why. All right. 
Are there churches around here we need to be aware of that would be considered a cult? Oh, you're really putting me on the spot there, aren't you? <laughs> um, I would say yes. I would be very leery about some things. Do not always extend the hand of fellowship with just anybody. I'm not going to just start naming names, though. But here's my, here's my task for you. If you want to know whether or not somebody is believing right, again, one, what is their stance on Jesus? Is he God in the flesh that died for your sins, rose again the third day? Are they preaching salvation correctly? Is it salvation through faith, God's grace? And if you follow those two key things right there, most of the time they're going to be pretty right. Now, you might disagree over a few things here or there or whatnot. No two people are ever going to agree on everything. But, again, if they get those two things right, odds are they're going to be correct. But do note that, again, you want to be careful about who you try to fellowship and learn from. Uh, the Bible tells us to try the spirits, whether they are of God or not. If it lines up with God's word, all right, yeah, if it doesn't, eh. Yep, get away. And also remember what I said, that if anybody ever claims that they know everything about the Bible, run away because they know absolutely nothing about the Bible. All right, so that's, that's, that's a good motto to have right there, a good rule of thumb. But again, I'm not going to just sit there and put anybody out there on the spot because, again, if you start doing that, some people will take offense and get mad, and then you'll lose the opportunity to actually have a conversation with them in the future. But again, just note their positions on Jesus, who Jesus is, and also salvation. And that should be a good guideline for you to know, are they true Christian or are they just, you know, having a false doctrine that they're teaching? So that's a good rule of thumb there. All righty. Oh, man. Let's see. So how do they get saved? So I'm guessing that's supposed to be for Jehovah's Witnesses. How do they get saved? Uh, we did mention that last night. That, again, they believe that it's through works, doing all the stuff and obeying all of Jehovah's commandments. So again, they believe that joining the Watchtower Society and submitting to its authority and doing everything that it says, that that will end up get, granting them salvation. But again, the Jehovah's Witness does not have a guarantee for heaven, right? They have no hope for heaven. They just have a hope for a paradise here on earth after everything's done. So... That is kind of their look outlook on salvation just once again. Well. All righty. What do you think about Elon Musk's first human microchip being implanted? Whoo. Well, one... Nobody's low jacking me. Um, just saying. Two, I know what this is referring to because a lot of people are worried that this will end up being uh, kind of the mark of the beast. And we'll be signaling that and everything. But here's the key thing about this. The mark of the beast, we do not have to worry about that right now. The mark of the beast is not our concern right now. It will not be a concern for anybody until after the rapture happens and then it's during the tribulation period when the beast, the Antichrist, actually comes to power. Everybody's so worried about 666, about the mark of the beast, this and that. If somebody gets 666 tattooed on their forehead, can they still get saved? Yes. Why? Because it means absolutely nothing right now in this dispensation. We are under the dispensation of grace. We're under the church age. The tribulation is the next dispensation. Again, when the rapture happens, we are all called home because of our failure to actually do what we were supposed to do. We're all looking forward to it, but every dispensation ends in failure when man is involved with it. So the rapture happens, and then the tribulation comes, and then the Antichrist demands everybody to be having the mark of the beast. That's when that's going to end up taking effect. All these things that are going out, well, is it leading up to it? Possibly. 
Because the way history runs, it has to have stuff build up to it. It just doesn't have a clear cut. Okay, all of a sudden, this just starts beginning. History is a timeline, right? It has all these things that bring stuff about. There's no clear cut distinctions. We, when we study history, we like to have these really nice, neat divisions and stuff, but there's really no such thing as those when you actually look at it historically. It's just everything has a gradual build. And the same thing with God and God's history and God's plan. It's a gradual build towards things. So, again, um, is it possibly going to end up being the mark of the beast? Who knows? Again, truthfully, I'm not worried about it. What I'm worried about is trying to see as many people who come to the Lord before the rapture happens so they ain't got to worry about it. That should be our primary concern. All righty. Let's see here. Hmm. What I consider a certain local church a cult. And I have the name of the church on here, but I'm, again, not going to say it. But I will say that I know the church, and I know the people who run the church very well. And I would say that... Um, there's a strong possibility. Cult might be a little bit of a hard word, but then again, if they're not preaching the truth, it you know pretty much ranks in there with it. I do know that that church is money hungry. They're only worried about your money, and they even they even go around and if you don't show up to church, they even go around and demand you give ten percent for that week. Um, they also have many programs to try to help the community to help you earn money, but if whatever money you earn, you still got to give them ten percent. I know that they don't teach salvation. So, yeah, so there's that with that. And yeah, some of y'all might be able to figure out maybe who I'm talking about, but yeah, I'm not going to name them by name. Uh, that's, that's more private conversation. Um, my wife's afraid I don't have any tact. <laughs> huh? Oh, yeah, and pray for them. She's telling me to pray for him and everything. I was just going to do so. I thought she was going, oh, thank God that he's, you know. <laughs> Sometimes you do have to, you know, wonder about me a little bit. So what is the number or proof that the Bible is real? So I'm guessing is just basically what are the evidences that the Bible's true? Or what the Bible says is true? I guess that's what the question is asking. Well, there's a lot of evidence to support the scripture. Uh, one, the fact that the, all of the predictions that the Bible has made have come to pass pretty much. The book of Daniel was so accurate in the predictions that it made about everything that was going to happen in the Middle East and the rise of the Babylonians, the per Medes and Persians, the Greeks and the Romans that everybody thinks it was written after the fact because it is so accurate in how it depicts everything that happened. But we have manuscripts that show that it was early. Uh, and that right there as well, manuscript evidence shows that this is not, that the Bible is not new. It is, you know, eyewitness accounts. A lot of people want to try to say the New Testament wasn't written until about 150 to 200 A.D. And that's just a bold-faced lie. We have, the earliest manuscript we have uh, was just a fragment, though, because, I mean, 2,000 years. I mean, come on, that's you know, going to probably, you know, not last very long. But we have the earliest fragment we have is from 1 Corinthians, showing that that book was written. And guess what? Since that book was written, 1 Corinthians 15 was in there. And guess what? Talking about the resurrection. And Paul saying that there are 500, there are still people alive today that can attest to the resurrection. And so 1 Corinthians, that fragment actually dates to right around 50 or so A.D., just giving a rough estimate. Um, there's also archaeological evidences to help show the Bible is accurate and the Bible's true. I could spend up, I have actually a whole, several series on biblical archaeology. I had to break it up. I didn't realize how much I'd have to break that up because of how much there actually is. I was just planning doing Old Testament, New Testament. Now I got to look and thought, man, there's like, I had to divide the Old Testament up into three things. <laughs> There's so much evidence archaeologically to support uh, the Bible. 
the fact that uh, Hezekiah's tunnel was discovered in Israel. The Bible mentions that, of how they built that while they are being laid under siege by Assyria. Nobody thought that that actually existed until they dug it up and found it. Um, if you really want to get early into biblical archaeology, uh, people started using the Bible to try to find places. No one actually believed Nineveh was a real city. Then somebody decided to open up the Bible. Where does the Bible say it is? I went right to where the Bible said it was, started digging, and hey, what do you know? There's Nineveh. They also didn't believe that the Hittites were a real people because there was no evidence for them whatsoever in the historical records that they had at the time. So guess what? Somebody ended up taking the Bible, looking, okay, just about where were they possibly at and everything. So they started digging around Turkey and stuff, and hey, what do you know? Found the Hittite civilization. The Bible has been proven over and over again archaeologically to be correct. Anytime anybody has ever tried to disprove the Bible with the archaeological field, they've always ended up proving it. Now that being said, they always try to say that they're disproving the Bible. For instance, oh, few, well, several years ago, they ended up making these claims that um, they ran DNA evidence on you know, some bones and stuff from ancient Israel and whatnot, and they had Canaanite origin. So the Bible's wrong that Israel didn't drive out all the Canaanites and stuff and everything. I was like, you didn't read the Bible very well, did you? Because God, yes, did command them to drive out all the Canaanites and kill them all, but did they? No, they did not, which is a source of a lot of their problems. And so the fact that there is Canaanite DNA actually found still in a lot of the ancient areas when Israel was still a kingdom and stuff, guess what? That actually proves the Bible is consistent. Some people also say, well, there's a lot of idols and stuff we find throughout all of ancient Israel as well. well. They weren't supposed to have any of those things and everything, so why do we find all that stuff? Again, you didn't read the scriptures, did you? You're just reading that one little section where God makes the command. And yes, God did command them not to do it, but guess what? They did it anyway. Which is, again, reason why the Assyrians and the Babylonians came through and wiped them out and put them into captivity. So finding all that stuff... Guess what? Confirms what the scripture says. And we're not even going to get into the scientific evidences for things. There are so many proofs, so many evidences that the Bible is true and real and that it is accurate. It's not even funny. I mean, like I said, we could spend all day talking about it. But that is a very good question there. I need to move on because I know I can get winded when I start talking about something, especially if it's a lengthy answer. All righty. What did you mean when you said we would someday be a queen? <laughs> well, I'm not talking about you know what a lot of people think of today, that's for sure. So, the church is considered to be the bride of Christ, right? We're the bride of Christ, we're the body of Christ. So, as the bride of Christ, there's going to be a marriage supper, right? So there's going to be a marriage supper. We see that in Revelation 19. While the world's going to hell in a handbasket during uh, the tribulation period, we're going to be up there feasting and enjoying life with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And now, am I saying that when we get to heaven and after everything's said and done, we're going to be sitting there ruling right there with Jesus and everything? I don't know. I don't know if we're going to have any type of ruling thing or whatnot i usually say that more as a about us being a queen more as a uh, thing to get you to think a little bit about our position in heaven because we're going to be like the crown jewel in heaven the church why because we're the bride and the reason why i say we're the queen why because who's the king our husband the lord jesus christ so since we are the bride and he is the king, then technically, you know, that kind of makes the church the queen. But does that mean that we're going to have all these powers, we're going to be equal to God and this and that? No, but we're going to be joint heirs with Christ. So whatever he inherits, we'll actually inherit as well. Why? Because we are his bride. And again, but that's not going to make us God by any means. Uh, we're still going to be you know, created beings, we're still going to be saved. We're still going to be there because of what Christ had done for us. We're not going to end up being gods on our own little planets like the Mormons think. 
Yes, I do believe that. So, but, um, so I usually kind of say that just to kind of get people to think a little bit about because a lot of people want to, again, take away a lot of the promises that God has given to Israel. And I kind of say that just to kind of show everybody, look, uh, Israel's role with God is more of a servant. But what? The church, again, is the bride. We have a higher position, spiritually speaking. Now, that's not to brag on us. Why? Because we should, we should be humble about this. But also, we should not lift ourselves up. Again, if you end up going to uh, Romans chapter 9 and 10, particularly chapter 10, I believe, is where it talks about the wild olive tree being grafted into the good olive tree. What not? So we don't need to bo- boast against the branches what God broke off the branches of Israel to graft us in for faith. Because why? He can take us out too. And he will eventually again with the rapture. We'll all be taken up. So that's kind of what I was meaning by that. Um, again, it was, it was more of a play on words than it was an actual title, so to speak. But again, the church is considered the bride of Christ. And if Christ is the king, then what does that make the bride? So there we go. That's just kind of my ideas about that. That's my personal, you know, take on some of that. But I will not, you know, die on that hill. I promise you. (laughs) All right. So are the Don Group Jehovah's Witnesses? You said they go door to door, light the Jehovah's Witnesses. So they are similar to the Jehovah's. They do not claim to be the same group, but they have a lot of the same teachings. So the Millennial Don people and stuff, um, again, they're a faction that broke away from the Jehovah's Witnesses after Russell died. So yes, they are, but they do not claim to be. But you can use the same tactics with them as you do with the Jehovah's Witnesses. They do go door to door, but again, since there's not nearly as many of them, your odds are a little bit lower that you'll encounter them. The only reason why I mentioned them as a faction of the Jehovah's Witnesses is again because there is an off chance that you may run across somebody who you know believes that, or you know even some of their publications. So. That being said, again, just to give you a heads up, that way you knew what you're dealing with whenever you get to it. So that's why I mentioned them before. And so, and what is God's theocratic government on earth? This is a twofer. So what do I mean by God's theocratic government on earth? So Jehovah's Witnesses believe that basically that the Watchtower Society basically uh, controls everything for the Lord on the earth. It makes all the decisions and is trying to basically bring in God's kingdom for Jehovah and set up everything for the kingdom to be on the planet. Basically, uh, a theocracy is simply a government that is run by a religion. And that's basically what they are hoping to create is a theocracy where they basically bring the entire world into subjection under the religion of the Jehovah's Witnesses. And they believe once they do that, then everything will end up hopefully falling into play a little bit more as well. So as a theocratic government on earth for, uh, for the Lord, they're claiming that they are God's spokesman, that they are able to speak for the Lord, they're, everything they do is for the Lord, and it's to further the Lord's kingdom in that regard. So again, they're basically again making themselves out to you know, be the Lord in a lot, and, take the, and take God's place. But so you don't question the organization because it is God's organization. And you only have allegiance to it and not to anything else. And so that's what that ends up meaning there. Hopefully I answered that one well, whoever had that. Oh, well, there's one more. Nope, oh, a couple more. Hey, I actually got through all of them. And we had about 11 minutes to spare. All right, so what is Jesus' role in the Jehovah's Witness program? So if Jesus is not Jehovah and he was a created being, what is his role? Well, his role, again, he started off, according to their beliefs, as Michael the Archangel, and he stayed obedient to Jehovah. And then he ended up taking the form of flesh and becoming a man. He, the Jehovah's Witnesses still believe that Jesus died for the sins of the world, that he did make that payment. 
<clears throat> pardon me, and that whenever he rose again, he rose again spiritually. But and uh, Pastor Sean told me he looked up that they that they actually believe that his body that Jehovah just caused his body to disintegrate. That's why the tomb was empty. Everything well, always have an answer for that, don't they? But so his role again, he created everything for Jehovah at the beginning. He paid for man's sins and stuff, and he's basically going to rule the kingdom of God for Jehovah. That's kind of basically the role, the role that they have for him. But again, he also has that role of a lesser God than Jehovah as well. So, and because of the fact of what he did, and he was offered as that sacrifice. But as far as any like long-term stuff, I honestly can't tell you, but I just know that their ideas about Jesus are just so completely false that, you know... It's just, you know, we got to make sure they know the truth about who he really is and everything. So I, I kind of stick to the basics, especially when I'm dealing with other people, because sometimes you can chase rabbits and get down there pretty long. But um, so, yeah, his role is just about the same, except, again, they just do not believe that Jesus is Jehovah, and they believe that he is a created being by Jehovah. So that was one of the big things with them with that so no last question that I see in the box I don't see any more in here would these tactics work on other cults so would the tactics that I just I gave you all for the Jehovah's Witnesses would that work on other cults well it depends on what you're talking about everybody is different in how they believe what they believe is different and indoctrinations are a little bit different. That being said, if you're dealing with anybody that's in a cult, breaking their trust from that organization, I would believe, would be the key for no matter which cult you're looking at. But you have to make sure that you understand what that cult is about and what they believe and that you know how to approach it. It's all about asking the right questions and getting them to think a little bit. Because, again, any cult sits there and tries to take away your individuality and tries to, you know, again, take away your right to think for yourself. So by learning what they believe, and then you can formulate questions that will, you know, help to guide them into thinking and showing them that that cult is not right. So would the tactics work for just about any cult? I would say probably yes. But you'd have to do your homework a little bit on which... Uh, each one that you're dealing with because again the questions you ask will be will always be different and you know sometimes even your approach might have to be just changed up just a little bit so again it really just depends on what they believe and how you present you know the gospel to them and I'll say this when you're dealing with a false religion like somebody that's in another religion entirely like a Muslim or a Hindu or a Buddhist the, there is no right way to do it for everybody because you have to literally mold and form a witnessing strategy specifically for those different groups. Cults are a little bit different because, again, they are all about control and that authority. So you can check, so if you can get them past that and get them to distrust that and learn that they're being deceived, then you can move forward with that as well. But religions is a little bit more. Uh, streamlined you have to actually have stuff for each individual religion by itself all right so we still got about six minutes i'm sure nobody would mind if we ended up leaving early or whatnot go get some food but uh just i'm gonna put it out there does anybody have any other questions or anything that they might want to ask or, or is anybody ready to go or all right we'll get So, all righty. So, did I answer the question before you asked it, or did I just pull out of the box? Oh, okay. That's what I was asking. Do what? Uh, I didn't pay. I just read the thing. I didn't pay attention to the rest of it, <laughs> and I don't remember. 
all the all the Don people. I thought you said that you drew the dog people or something on there. I was like, I didn't pay. I didn't. I don't remember saying.